Hi, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the Museum of the City of New York. It's so nice to have you all with us tonight. Uh, my name's Fran Rosenfeld, and I'm the Museum's Director of Public Programs. Thank you so much for joining us for this evening's talk, Athletes to Activists, Politics of the Playing Field. Um, and we are absolutely thrilled to have um, John Carlos and Howard Bryant join us for this conversation. So, yeah. yeah. And more about them in just a second, but I wanted to say that as many of you know, maybe not everyone, this talk accompanies um, the museum and the Jackie Robinson Foundation's new exhibition, In the Dugout with Jackie Robinson, an intimate portrait of a baseball legend. And uh, the exhibition, which is on the third floor, if you hadn't, haven't had a chance to check it out yet, we're going to keep the gallery open tonight after the program until 8.30. So please um, make your way up there to the third floor and have a look, if you haven't already. This exhibition is presented in honor of the centennial of Jackie Robinson's birth. And it features images of Robinson and the Dodgers taken for Look Magazine along with memorabilia, rare footage of the Robinson family, and the published magazines, all of which provide a lens into Robinson and his world. Um, as the first black major league baseball player of the modern era, Robinson paved the way for athletes to be the harbingers of social change. Tonight, to discuss the complex relationship between black athletes and activism and the intertwined worlds of sports and politics, we are thrilled to be joined by Olympian John Carlos, who famously raised his fist in silent protest at the 1968 Olympic Games in Mexico City to protest American racial and economic injustices. And he will be joined in conversation by Howard Bryant of ESPN, um, who is a writer and commentator and author of The Heritage, Black Athletes, A Divided America, and the Politics of Patriotism. Uh, the event is co-presented by the Jackie Robinson Foundation, and I'd like to thank them for making this evening possible. Especially, I'd like to thank Stephen Lynch and Eric Yeslin at the Foundation for all of their work in putting together this program. We really couldn't have done this without them. Um, and following the conversation, as I mentioned, please join us on the third floor to see In the Dugout with Jackie Robinson. Also, Howard Bryant um, will be signing his book, which is The Heritage, Black Athletes, A Divided Era, America, and the Politics of Patriotism, um, on, right outside our museum shop on the first floor. He'll be at a table on the first floor, um, uh, right outside the bookshop, and all the books tonight, uh, his books tonight, will be 15% off for attendees. So if you're interested in getting your book signed, please head up to the first floor after the program. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank the supporters of this program, Jim Hanley and the Taconic Builders. We're extremely grateful for their support. And I now I'm going to ask you to turn off anything that makes any noise, but feel free to tweet using the hashtag MCNYLive. And it's now my honor to invite Della Britton Baeza, the president and the CEO of Jackie Robinson Foundation, to the stage to say a few words and introduce our panelists formally. Please join me in giving her a warm round of applause. Thank you, Fran, very much. It's been such a pleasure working with you and your team these last several months. Um, this partnership started, um, and I know we're in a neighborhood crowd because some of you literally told me that you walked around the corner to come to this event, so I like the fact that this is a very New York event. But, but it started when a few of us were chatting, friends of ours who worked at the Museum of the City of New York, and we learned at the Jackie Robinson Foundation that MCNY had a wonderful treasure trove of photographs of Jackie Robinson, many never before seen. Again, it's imperative that you go and see the exhibit, um, if not today, another day. But when we learned that, we got together with, uh, I guess, Sean Corcoran, who was the, the curator for the Museum of the City of New York, and we were able to provide some of the video footage, um, again, rarely seen, uh, from the Robinson family that is now part of our collection for the upcoming museum that I'll speak about in a second. And there was born um, the In the Dugout exhibit, and we are so proud of it and so excited by it, and I cannot think of better partners than the people at MCNY. In fact, I, I 
I want to be sure to thank as well the director and president of MCNY, Whitney Donhauser, uh, who worked with us um, on opening night when the exhibit opened. Um, I want to thank Polly Rua, who is here, I think, tonight, who is the vice president for institutional advancement at MCNY. Um, and of course, Fran, and, and as well, I, I want to mention uh, Lillian Lesser. And Lillian Lesser, I don't know if she's here tonight, but she also, um, as a program coordinator here at MCNY, has been wonderful working with us. And I'd also like to introduce a very special guest tonight who I am so thrilled was able to make it uptown, who is actually visiting not just from the offices in Lower Manhattan of the Jackie Robinson Foundation, but who literally uh, lives in uh, West Af lives in uh, the Horn of Africa and East Africa and Tanzania, and he is the son uh, of Jackie Robinson. His name is David Robinson, and he will kill me for this at the end of tonight, but I would like to ask him to stand. He's as modest and humble as his mother, but he is a dynamo, and he is one of our guiding lights. Seriously, you can only imagine what it's like when you're doing something like a museum, not just learning from these wonderful professionals at MCNY, but also having the family there in your midst, and a family, the Robinson family, that is supportive, um, that is the, great, the, the best combination of being supportive and yet not sort of overreaching, if you will. Um, so David, you know how we feel about you, and thank you for being here tonight, making the effort to come up. Um, we also have a, I, I'd like to mention that we have a full plate this entire year. Um, we are planning in the centennial year to open the Jackie Robinson Museum the first or second week, it hasn't been confirmed yet, of December. This year, the Jackie Robinson Museum will open at 75 Varick Street at the intersection of Varick and Canal, um, which is literally known as the intersection of Tribeca and Soho, of those two neighborhoods. So if you've ridden by and seen our, our windows, um, stay tuned, and we hope to see all of you there beginning in December. Um, I also want to mention that um, um, tonight's program is extra special for us as well because it very much serves as a prototype of the kind of programming that we are planning to do at the Jackie Robinson Museum, and that is programming that speaks to the values and the principles that are embodied in the life of Jackie Robinson and Rachel Robinson, the founder of our foundation, um, who still today is as vital and as much of, as a guiding force um, to me after my 15 years here as she was my first day at the foundation. She is um, just a very special woman and um, we can't wait to watch her cut that ribbon in December of the museum. Um, I'll also say that um, we're excited that tonight's program will also fits squarely into the types of issues that we will tackle at the Jackie Robinson Foundation. You know, athletes and activism did not start with Colin Kempernick. Um, and, and it, I mean, I don't know if I can say summarily that it didn't start with Jackie Robinson, but certainly Jackie Robinson is very much on that map in terms of his activism and his courage in speaking out. And, you know, somewhat ironically, this country in our current social discourse um, is revisiting the notion of what one's First Amendment rights are. But I'll leave some of that dialogue for our guests. And, and while you have a program that gives a little bit of their biography, just briefly, I want to tell you that um, our heartfelt introduction of these two gentlemen whom we know, and I don't know if John Carlos remembers, he probably doesn't, but it was a highlight of my um, last few years when I sat on a panel with him um, at a sports conference in Los Angeles, and I was so impressed by him, and more importantly, um, he and I, I think, were in cahoots on that panel. We were on a panel with some other people who didn't quite um, agree with some of the things we were saying, so it's nice to have this homecoming. But he is a world record holder in the 100 and 200 sprints and a native New Yorker, importantly, famously representing the United States in the 1968 Summer Olympics in Mexico City winning the bronze medal alongside his U.S. teammate Tommy Smith, the gold medalist, who in solidarity lifted their fists during the national anthem wearing black gloves, black socks, no shoes, on the ceremonial Olympic stage, all in a peaceful protest of the injustices being endured by black Americans for too long. And by the way, I don't know if John Carlos will speak to this, but the, the silver medalist in, on that day in 1968 was Australian Peter Norman, who actually showed some support for their protest. I think he wore a band, a, a um, human rights, I think it was a, a, 
I don't have the name of it here, but I think it was a human rights badge or band on his arm, and he wanted to express his, and he, I think, suffered the wrath of his countrymen when he went back home for doing that as well. But the stark image of John Carlos and Tommy Smith that day is one of the most iconic of the civil rights movement and certainly in the sports world. Anxious for you to hear more from him. Howard Bryant, who will join Dr. Carlos on stage, has been a good friend to the foundation, good friend personally, Howard, an advisor to me on many issues in sports as I learn this field. He is an award-winning author and sports journalist, most of you may know. When it comes to the intersection of race and professional sports, few have spoken, let alone written, so eloquently for NPR's weekend edition with Scott Simon. Um, few have actually written um, the number of books, few sports journalists have written the number of books that Howard has. And some of it's in your programming, but not all of it. And I want to tell you that he's the author of several books, including Shut Out, A Story of Race and Baseball in Boston, which was published in 2002 and which won the Casey Award for the Best Baseball Book of the Year. Um, he subsequently wrote books on Hank Aaron. In fact, uh, a treatise on Hank Aaron, which I, I read, and the name of it is actually Henry Aaron. For those of you who know the difference between Hank and Henry Aaron, um, there's a story there as well. Um, he wrote a book on steroid use in Major League Baseball, a book on Venus and Serena Williams, and his most recent book, The Heritage, Black Athletes, A Divided America, and the Politics of Patriotism especially relevant to this evening's program. I could go on and on about Howard. Some of you may know him from being on um, uh, documentaries that Ken Burns produced, The Tenth Inning. He was in the baseball series that he did, and he was also in um, Ken Burns' 2016 Jackie Robinson four-hour series. Without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to these two gentlemen, Howard Bryant and John Carlos. Be here. It's good to be alive. <laughs> good, af good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's really an honor to be back in New York and see so many smiling faces. Glad that you guys could come out and share the evening with, with us. This is a home game for you. Yes, it is. <laughs> Homecoming. And homecoming. Yes. Yeah, we uh, have to say that uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the museum and also the foundation for asking me to do this and obviously to be able to sit up here with John, this is what, three times for us now. Two, uh, one last year in uh, Los Angeles, and then I got to watch you on stage in San Jose, and now here we go again. So this has been just an honor for me to be able to even be up here. So thank you for this. Well, how would I thank you, man? I, I kind of think every time you go to work, I'll go to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was thinking about this, and when I was just looking at, at some of the bios, you were, you were, 11 years old when Jackie played his last game. And when I was thinking about that, that was obviously in 56, the World Series year, and I was thinking as well when I was working on the on book research that Jackie, even though had so much difficulty with supposedly the new generation that didn't think he was hip and didn't think that he was down with, with the new struggle, he was one of the people who really did support the Olympic Project for Human Rights. And so I just wanted to ask you, what were your recollections of Jackie as a kid? And then also, what did he mean to you when you were about to start the protest with, with Dr. Edwards and Tommy and everybody? Well, you know, I have a personal relationship with Jackie Robinson I, from the time I was a little kid. Uh, Jackie Robinson and Roy Campanella and Don Newcomb and guys like that, they used to like to play poker a lot. Uh, my father used to have little poker games going on the weekends. So like the Giants and the Dodgers and a few other players come to town, they would come through and play. And I remember uh, my mom would cook the dinners and my brother and I would be arguing about whose turn it was to take the dinner out because every time we took the dinner, we'd get in the tip. <laughs> And, and I remember my father introduced Jackie Robinson to me as his friend. And uh, I guess a couple of months later, I was at the YMCA on 135th Street, and it was showing a film called The Jackie Robinson Story. And you know, as kids would be when you're in the theater and they turn the lights out, you want to get in there and play around. We're playing, and, and when the movie started, there was Jackie Robinson, my father's friend. 
And I'm telling my buddies, man, stop playing. I said, what's the matter? I said, man, that's my father's friend. Me, your father, knew it. man, stop playing. <laughs> and I, I really, truly believe that Jackie Robinson was one of the most important individuals in my life at that particular time to uh, make me realize that we had social issues or social problems to deal with. Because other than him being my father's friend, I had no clue that this man was such a great athlete, such a great individual, multi-athletic. And then I began to watch his teammates in this movie by how they responded to him, how the spectatorship responded to him, how they threw that black cat in there on the field on him. And I began to realize that here's a man that has so many gifts that God gave him to share with the world. And just merely because of the color of his skin, he was ridiculed and put down and, and just embarrassed so many different ways until it stayed with me, I guess, throughout my life in terms of realizing that something is broke and you're looking around as a child to see who's going to step up to fix it. Well, I didn't see a whole bunch of people jumping in line to try and fix this, these uh, issues that we had confronting us. But just, yes, Jackie Robinson was very significant in my life, in the early part of my life, to uh, realize who he was and what he had to endure. And then I'll find out later, because I've, uh, Jackie Robinson's brother, his older brother, Mac, and I became very good friends later on in my life. And I began to find out that Jackie wasn't as cool as Rick Branch, he might have thought. You know, Rick, uh, he's got the patience and he has the endurance. Jackie was a fire, he was, a, he was dynamite. If you was out of line, he would confront you. Uh, that's no doubt. He would get in your face and let you know what he felt. And I was coming from his oldest brother. And he used to always tell me he taught Jackie everything he knew. You know? <laughs> Okay, go on now. No, no, no. I was going to ask you about Mac as well because we were talking earlier about what history does and when we talk about time, Mac didn't always get his due right. for the things that he had done as well. Well, it, it was those times, you know, Jackie didn't get his, Mac didn't get his, nor did Jess, Jesse Owens get his. You know, uh, we were great symbols for society, but just being a great symbol wasn't enough. Uh, they always had to throw the color game in there. You know, you had to be like white sugar in order to receive admiration for what you've done in your career. Uh, but it didn't deter us. We knew it was that way, and we knew by being who we were, those that were before myself, before Jackie, like Jack Johnson, we knew the precedent that we were setting would make it possible for so many others to come in. Mm -hmm. And hopefully they will have their heads screwed on tight enough to realize where they came from. What, what did it mean to you when you were starting the Olympic project to have Jackie speak out? And, and I remember what he said, and he gave a quote, I think it was in his testimony and also in, in newspaper articles where he was saying, I, I know that this protest is not going to be successful, but I applaud them for trying to make change. Well, I think Jackie knew that it wasn't going to be successful in terms of those in the ranks, those that was in the, in the trenches, so to speak. Uh, we were never settled enough to be one as a whole to say this is something that's, that's necessary. Yes, I would like to go to the Olympic Games. I would like to represent my country. But there's other things that's far more valuable to individuals such as Jackie Robinson or John Carlos or Paul Robeson or Jack Johnson, uh, where we felt that it was necessary to try and educate individuals. We can't push anything on you without knowledge. So we tried to educate them as well as we could to uh, let them have a fair evaluation as to whether they felt it was necessary to, to go to the games or stay home from the games. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesse had, um, Jesse, uh, Jackie Robinson, uh, all the old players, they knew what was going on in terms of the divide and conquer uh, situation that's been taking place for eons and it's still working today. You see Mr. Kaepernick, and what's going on in the NFL right now, we're still divided in that issue. So, you know, I think the bottom line out of the dust or the trail of Jackie Robinson would be that we've educated our minds quite a bit. And I 
think through Jackie Robinson, we saw that he didn't have fear for things that he had to deal with. He just dealt with them. Uh, and many other individuals back in that day dealt with situations that we can't even imagine what they had to deal with back at that time relative to what I had to deal with in 1968. So I know what it was like in 1936 and beyond. But they set such strong precedents at that time until the John Collins came about. Uh, a Kaepernick came about. And, you know, like I told someone 50 years ago, when they came to me and asked me, he said, what do you think you accomplished? And I told him, I said, obviously I accomplished something because you never come to me with the mic and ask me that before. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but what I really feel that I've accomplished is the fact that I was able to be a horticultural a gardener and I was able to plant seeds and water it when I could, and when I couldn't water it, God took care of the rest. And what you see today, you see so many young, serious activists out there. And activism is not something that's in one gender or one color. Activism is something that falls out of the sky and it can hit anyone at any time. Back in 1968, and I'm sure back in Jesse Owens' time and Jackie Robinson's time, there wasn't a whole bunch of leaves on the tree to say, we here support you. But as today, you see many young individuals stepping up and they understand what it means to be an activist, to stand for what's right in society. Mm -hmm. Your business card, which I still have, even though I don't need it anymore, but I still like it, I keep it. It says, the world's fastest humanitarian. <laughs> <laughs> and you had quite a year last year. And we were talking about all of the 50th anniversaries, because we do like our anniversaries in this country, which means it's the one time we're gonna pay attention to this stuff and then we'll see if we continue to pay attention to it. But during 2018, you were everywhere. You were back down in Mexico City and you and Tommy and Wyoming and everybody, uh, you, you were in all these different places. And uh, what were your feelings about that anniversary, about the interest that people had in that 50? What did that 50 mean in terms of reflecting to you? And also that gap in between. One of the things we've been talking about for the past year has been sort of a almost a, a reflection of a lot of folks who weren't there during those 50 years in between who are here now. So what were your feelings in terms of the anniversary and then also that space in between? Well, the first thing was how fast 50 years can go. <laughs> that, was, that was the first thing. I said, it seemed like to me it just happened just last month. You know, 50 years has gone down. Uh, but relative to the 50 year span, I had made up in my mind that at the end of that 50 years, I didn't have any more comments. You know, all the press called me, news magazines, TV, radio, everybody's calling. And I tell them I have one comment, and that's no comment. And what do you mean? You, you have to speak. You have to speak. And I felt like I've spoken for 50 years. I don't see what 50 years in a day is going to change your mind. So there's no need me speaking about the same issues over and over again. Let's talk about something new. Uh, so I look at 50 years now in terms of saying, I talked about what white folks did, the negative side of the white society. Now it's time for me, the old man, to start zeroing in on what black people have done to themselves and what we need to do to try and put our train back on the track and run in the right direction. I think that's my goal for the next 50 years to tell them, say, hey, man, we have to put our petty differences aside and take our egos and bury them and try and deal with the, the issues at hand and try and resolve these things. Because as, as I stated 50 years ago, I didn't put my fists up to the sky for John Carlos. I had a young daughter at that time. My daughter was on, in the world. I felt like everything I did at that time was for my daughter. I have five kids now. Everything I've been doing for 50 years has been for my kids, as well as for your kids, to try and make it a better, cohesive society for all of us to live in. So I don't know whether you guys could tell your wives or your wives know about what war is all about. But war is a terrible thing. And you be on the battlefield, that's one thing. It's terrible. But it's even worse when you have wars in your streets and you have wars on social issues. We have wars on racial issues. The only one that's gonna be able to resolve these issues are you. Howard can't do it. I can't do it. 
Malcolm X couldn't do it. Dr. King do it. But we can do it. When I say we, meaning the people coming together and saying enough is enough. It's so divisive right now. From the White House on down. And I'm not knocking who is in the White House. I am. I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm knocking... I'm knocking the policies. I ain't gonna throw no names about who he is because I truly believe that God sent that man here to the White House to wake us up. Okay? I mean, it has to be something really terribly bad <laughs> for us to wake up. You know, it's like God sends in, sometimes he sent an earthquake or he sends a flood. <laughs> well, he sent it to the human race. He sent the Trump. Okay? And if this man doesn't wake us up and galvanize us to come together to make this a better society, I don't know, God help us after that. What were your feelings about 2018? I mean, when I saw you in June in LA, it seemed like there was, once again, a lot of conversation about reflecting and reflecting and reflecting. But so much was happening presently. We were talking about, you know, we were, whether we're talking about Colin Kaepernick or Malcolm Jenkins or what's happening in the NBA with LeBron and all of this, you have so many different, uh, so many different areas where you don't have to look backwards to see what's happening or to, to, to have any sort of opinion. How do you feel about players today? Where do you feel, you know, when, we were in, when we were in San Jose at the 50th, um, I had made a point to you and to Tommy as well to say that the money is so great right now that I don't think that you can compare the two. I don't think you can compare the fact that, that you were working as a security guard, you know, that you were doing all of these different things to simply try to make a minimum wage after what was taken from you. Whereas opposed to athletes today, at the very least, you're looking at 10, 20, 30, the major league baseball minimum, just to step on a major league baseball field is $600,000. So when you reflect and when people talk to you about these phrases, athlete activism and everything, what is your feeling about where the role of the athlete is today? Where, where are they? What's their mission? Well, you know, we had an old statement years ago here in New York. The statement was, all money is not good money. You know, these athletes out there, they're getting the money. But I think a lot of them are ignorant uh, to the fact. I think a lot of them think they get by freedom. You know, and they can't buy their freedom. You have to earn your freedom. You have to step up to the plate. And most of them want to go with the thought in mind that I have blinders on. All I can see is the football field. All I can see is the basketball field. You know, it's a runner can be a sprinter or a runner can be a marathon runner. But they're both runners. I like to stay in the race until the race is won. You know, I'm not the short man. I, mean, I didn't get in the game in 1968 to say in, in 1970 I'm going to quit. I'm in the game until I'm satisfied that I see change. I'm in the game until I sa I'm satisfied I see these youngsters can step up to the plate and take up where I leave off. I'm in the game until I can go home and my kids understand who I am and what I stood for in society. I'm in the game until people start to wake up. All I can do is be that beacon in the sky for these young athletes to look up and say, wow, man, let me turn the page back because I did see someone that did something contrary to what, what everyone else did. Who is this guy? See, because you sit back and the young lady asked me about Peter Norman. You sit back and you think about Peter Norman. Peter Norman, a white, blue-haired kid from Australia. If you remember, Australia was parallel to South Africa in terms of their attitude. Peter Norman realized, I don't know about American blacks, but I do know about the black aboriginals. And what has happened to the black aboriginals is wrong. I hear the whispers about what's happening to blacks in America. That's a parallel in my mind. I will support anyone that's against segregation. I will support anyone that's against racism. He put a badge on it that said, Olympic Project for Human Rights. But the devil came after him, not because he got up and he spoke and said, I support Tommy Smith and I support John Collins. They came after him just merely because he was a white kid that said, I believe in human rights. But he wasn't the only one. 
If you sit back, you think about it, we had a guy named Frederick Douglass. Abolitionists ran all over this country trying to free people up, free their minds. Well, he had a blonde haired white guy with blue eyes, just like Peter Norman named John Brown. Why did they erase John Brown out of history? All you seniors in here, you silver haired individuals, you remember John Brown when you was in <laughs> grade school. They taught you about John Brown. But by the time you got to be a senior, they kicked John Brown up under the bus. And then you say, okay, let's go modern day to Mr. Kaepernick taking a knee. Now, when Mr. Kaepernick took that knee, he didn't take the knee by himself. It wasn't all black people that just knelt down with him. It wasn't a black guy that was standing next to him that took his hand and put it on his shoulder. It was Howie Long's son. Last time I looked at Howie Long, Howie Long looked like a white guy to me. <laughs> they supported Kaepernick. Oh, that's my wife about to beat me up. <laughs> I'm going to turn this phone off. Airplane mode. Are you, she FaceTiming you? Hold on one second. Hey, Kimmy, Kimmy, Kimmy. Hey, listen, your first grade teacher is here, and she wants to talk to you. Are you in the audience? Could you come up here and get this phone? Come and get this phone. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> Now I can go back. Where do I leave off? <laughs> More stuff you can't make up. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm real. You know what I mean? There's no <laughs> ifs, ands, and buts about it. This is Johnny Carlos. This is the way you're going to have to deal with me. I'm on the spot, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> so where, where do I leave off? Help me. You were talking about, you were talking about John oh, Brown. Yeah. The Harpers so I, was talking about, I was talking about Howie Long, right? So when, when I, I sit back and I say, now why is it they erased John Brown out of history? Why is it their race, Peter Norman out of history? Why is it their race, Howie Long, out of history? Is that they trying to tell white folks that you shouldn't have moral character? You shouldn't have faith and have tolerance? We don't want you whites to see that we have young white individuals or we have white individuals that has a clear mind and a clear path the worst reality in society? That's a question you need to ask the media. Why did you erase Peter Norman out of that picture for 40 plus years? Why did you come back and try and put it on John Collins and Tommy Smith like we kicked them off the picture? We put them off of TV. We never spoke about Peter Norman. So far from the truth. But see, you have to be able to read between the lines. This is not 1955 where you go and turn your TV on and the, the, the TV or the movie critic come on and tell you whether you should go to watch a movie or not. You should be sharp enough in 2019 to figure it out yourself. The movie critic can't tell you which way to go. The day when the horse and the buggy was out there and they put blinders on the horse, it's almost like they put those same blinders on society. We don't want you to look at what's happening over the right. We don't want you to look at what's happening on the left. We want you to look straight ahead. And I've never been born to look straight ahead. If I look straight ahead in my neighborhood around here in Harlem, I'd not made it to 73 years old. <laughs> I had to look around to see what's around me. I appreciate coming up in this city. I appreciate the talent that grew up with the New York Yankees, the, the New York Giants, and the Brooklyn Dodgers. They, they talk about the Brooklyn Dodgers. They forget about that bum that they used to have over in Brooklyn. <laughs> See, y'all don't remember, it used to be a Brooklyn bum was the mascot for the Dodgers. Okay? So things are changing. So if things like that can change around, you just imagine when people come together and have one mindset, how much we could change this world. Mind you, that guy that's in the White House, He's doing everything he can possibly do to make you start to use your brain. <laughs> we were talking a couple of weeks ago uh, after Colin got his settlement mm. and what was going to happen to 
protest and what did it mean and whether or not there was a, the, the conversation as to whether or not people thought he had sold out and all of that. What were your feelings when you heard the news of that? Well, first of all, you know, sell out. You, you say sell out. Is he a sell out merely because he took a lawsuit out and by the grace of God he won the lawsuit, picked up $80 million? <laughs> I mean, that's not being a sellout. That's being a smart businessman. Okay. And nor did he and, protest. And no, I was going to say, nor did he sue them for protest. He sued for a lot he for, sued for, for the money for his job. Keep him from lost his job. That's why he took the lawsuit. He didn't take the lawsuit because they told me he couldn't take a knee. He took the lawsuit because you telling me I can't throw that sparrow pass anymore, and that's my profession. That's just like them telling Muhammad Ali he can't box anymore. That's like telling John Carlos or telling Jesse Owens, when you come on from the games after 36, when you come on to America, you're never going to run track anymore. Why? Why do they have the right to tell individuals they, they can't participate because we didn't follow their lead? No, Mr. Kaepernick is not a sellout. We're just going to have to wait and see what he does in, in the interim. He's got $80 million to play with. You don't know whether he's going to fund programs to help people in the city. You know, it's just like him hitting the lotto. You hit a lotto, you don't know what you're going to do with that money. You got to take some time to figure out what you're going to do. But I don't think that he's backing away from his, from his mission. And I think people have a confusion about, you know, the fact that he had money. Like, when Kaepernick came out, some people said he was Uncle Tom because he had $5 million in his bank account. Okay, well, John, you didn't have nothing, right? I didn't have five cents in my bank account. I didn't have a bank account. <laughs> I said, but the bottom line is the fact that he had $5 million in his bank account, it didn't deter him from standing up for what was right. Think about those individuals that call him a sellout or individuals that say he's not black oriented or he's not black conscious. Think about the money that he was putting in jeopardy for saying, I'm not concerned about me, I'm concerned about those that's less fortunate than me. The likelihood of me being a quarterback in the NFL and having them put a gun in my head and blowing my brains out, uh, the odds are against that happening to me. But the odds are stacked against so many other that look like me. So he chose to step up and make a statement. And those individuals, one more time, that say he's a sellout, he, he shouldn't be there, he don't represent me, it goes back to that word that I used earlier called ignorance. You know, we still have a lot of ignorant people running around in society, and it's our job as society to reach these individuals to try and bring them up to par. Each one, teach one. And also when you were talking about erasure and media, that's one of the things that we always talk about. History writes people out of the story. It's our job to write them back into right. the story. One of the things that drives me crazy when we sit up here and do these things is when we have a packed house of people and they don't get a chance to ask questions because we could just go on all day. No, man, no, and, no. and then we do our thing and people say, well, they only had two questions. So let's open it up if anyone has anything that they'd like to say, could we pass on the mic? Actually, before we do that, thank you, John, for your time. Thank you for doing this again, as always. And, um, I think we're gonna pass mics around, and if you uh, have a question, could you stand up so we can see you and hear what you have to say? Yes, sir. Two thousand eleven. I happen to have two copies. Uh, would it be possible to get it signed at the end of the evening? <laughs> <laughs> well, I means you buy two copies, I'm gonna put a toe print there too. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to come across yeah. the app right here. Uh, first, I'd like to say that those of us of your age um, who grew up in our most formative years in the worst decade in the century with very little uplifting, maybe the young blacks and who integrated the stores in the South and were hosed were the only other heroes I can think of you and Tommy were heroes, and you sort of closed the decade on an up note, and I think uh, we all owe you a lot for that. Mike. Mike. Thank you. 
My, my question is, before the U.S. Olympic Committee threw you under the bus, did they actually have the nerve to talk to you about their decision to let you go and therefore keep the rest of the team there and not have Brundage throw out the entire team? Or they just, you got it by third hand? No, the next day we got it first hand. You know, we actually didn't stay in the village until the night before the race. Uh, we came to Mexico City, we stayed there two days in the village and then our wives came to town, and quite naturally, my wife wasn't going to stay in the village, so I had to stay in the hotel where she stayed. We stayed in the same hotel that the International Olympic officials stayed, and out of courtesy to the coach, uh, where they wouldn't panic, we went back and stayed in the village the night before the race. Uh, we knew what it took to get on the victory stand. Uh, only person that could stop us or give us a bad day was God. And God said, y'all don't see nothing but sunshine ahead. <laughs> and we went on and we qualified. You know, everything was for naught if we didn't make the top three. So uh, we went there. We did what we were supposed to do. We, we uh, got a message from the Olympic Committee the next day talking about they want us to vacate the Olympic Village. And, and then when I came down to the hotel, uh, Tommy and I were coming down the elevator, and I heard him talking in Spanish. And... Uh, I told Tommy, I said, man, I don't know Spanish, but I know Spanish. <laughs> I said, you know, I don't speak it, but I hear my mother talking enough. And I think they said that they're going to take our medals away and they're going to run us out of the country. And I'll never forget when we got down in the lobby of the hotel, all the reporters swamped us. And they started asking questions. And the first one was, they said they was going to kick us out of the country. And I remember I had my visa in my back pocket, and I pulled the visa out, and I read it to them, and I said, the visa states, if I haven't broken any laws of the country, I'm entitled to stay there until November, I think it was November 22nd, 1969. <laughs> so I told them right away, I said, I think I'm going to go down to Acapulco and hang out a little while and come on back for the closing ceremony. And before I could digest that, they said, well, listen, the Olympic Committee said they're going to take your medals away. Now, this is a falsity that's been going on for 50 years. You know, many people think they took our medals. They threatened to take the medals. And I gave them a threat, too. I told them, I said, listen, you want to bring your troops? Bring the militia. Don't bring some of them. Bring all of them. This medal doesn't mean anything to me, but the medal might mean everything to my kids. That medal is their medal. You didn't give me the medal. You didn't knock on my door and tell me, come, there's a slot. You want to put me on the Olympic team? You set a standard. I had to meet the standard. I went to the Olympic Games. By the grace of God, I met the standard again. So if you think you're going to come and take something that I earned, bring the militia because you're going to need them. So they backed away, and they didn't never open their mouth to us directly about those medals, but they lied to the general public for 50 years. They lied. And why they lie? They lie to intimidate your kids. To have your kids think, we've been telling you all the time since you was knee high to a grasshopper, go for the goal, go for the goal. Now we're telling you we're going to take the goal away if you step out of the box. So it's all about intimidation. And if you sit back and you think about intimidation, when you talk about Jackie Robinson, and Jackie Robinson didn't have all the players to come together to support the, the I might say, the hurricane that he was in. They didn't come to his aid as one. They didn't come to our aid in Mexico as one. So when you sit back and you think about, you know, how fragmented, you know, the situation is, it was fragmented then in 1968. A lot of people had that same factor, the fear factor. Not so much about what happened to me, but what could happen to me just based on what I see happening to John Carlos or Tommy Smith or Peter Norman. But it's one thing if I say, any Geminis in the house? <laughs> Geminis. I love you, Geminis. And, and, and obviously, God loves you too. And the reason I'm saying that is because the three individuals that was on that victory stand October 16, 1968, all three of them were Geminis. <laughs> I was born June 5th, 1945. Tommy Smith was born June 6th, 1944. And Peter, Peter Norman was born June 15th, 1943. Stair steps. So he knew that the Geminis had hard enough to do what needed to be done. Okay? 
or maybe we were just crazy enough to do it, it had to be done. So, question. I'll get that, yeah, sure. Well, my attitude has always been um, we like to blame people, and we always like to blame whoever is on the bottom for whatever is happening at the top. And when you listen to people talk about not wanting black players or how, why are there are so few black players, there are 67 black players in Major League Baseball today. That's 7%, 6%, 6.5%, something like that, 750 players. And when you listen to people talk about why, they'll say, oh, because black kids don't want to play baseball anymore. They want to play basketball. They want question, to play football. question, question. You say 67 baseball players black. Mm -hmm. American black. black. American black, okay. Yeah, if you had Latinos now, in there, except in, in the 30s. Let's do a comparison with the 67, and let's think about how many baseball diamonds that we've lost here in America. Okay, well, you mentioned by how it used to be back in the day when Jackie Robinson came in, and they had baseball diamonds all over America. Any ethnic group had a baseball diamond where they can go and play. Go look for those baseball diamonds today. At parks, you had infrastructure, and it's not there anymore. No more baseball. Mm -hmm. So if kids don't have the attitude or the desire to play baseball, it's because there's nowhere for them to play baseball. We used to have block parties and, 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 and block the street off. We would play stickball. And the Dodgers and the Giants used to come play stickball with us. Those days don't take place anymore. Yeah, you know, my attitude on this is if you look for players, you're going to find them. And Major League Baseball today, they look for players in three areas. They look for college players. They look for Latino players. They look for international players. And they look for, obviously, the players are in the suburbs. Baseball, ex it's an expensive travel sport. Now. I, was, I was getting ready to say right. it's economics, a money sport now. economics is right. involved heavily. So in college, the NCAA baseball, it's 2% black. So you're not going to get college black players because baseball is non-revenue. So there's no scholarships for the black kids. The black kids get scholarships. They play basketball. They play football. All right. When you go to the international market, when you go to the Dominican, where you have all the academies, those kids are not subject to the draft. Therefore, a Major League Baseball team, the Yankees, the Red Sox, the Dodgers, whatever, they can go down there and they can essentially buy thousands of poor Dominican kids for the same price as one American player. That's right. So that's where the players are going. And if you look at the black players today, Look at Kyler Murray, the kid from Oklahoma is going to play football now because the other sports are doing something that baseball never did. They're competing for black players. Baseball does not compete for black players. They're trying now. They've got all these different initiatives now. But the bottom line is the economics have pushed black kids out of this game. And I still say if you look for black, if you look for players, you're going to find them. If you put a ball and a stick in front of a kid, they're going to play with it. And, and it's just, it's, a, it's, it's money more than anything else, but when you listen to people talk, they make it sound like African Americans simply have no interest in baseball anymore, and it's simply not true. I remember talking to Billy Bean about this, the general manager of the Oakland A's, and, and I, he told me that one of the big problems was that black players are too expensive now. And in a way, he's right. When you look at Barry Bonds and Ken Griffey Jr. at the time, and you think about the top black players, they made all the money. Well, you know, you sit back, you say, they said, they mm -hmm. said and that they they're said. too expensive. Mm -hmm. But then when you sit back and say, let's think about when it wasn't expensive, mm -hmm. but it was expensive. In other words, somebody was making the money back in the day, but the players wasn't being paid relative right. to the money that was being made. And then when you sit back, you mentioned your Costa Rica, Cuba, uh, the Dominican Republic, 
in terms of those young individuals playing baseball. They just magnified what we had here back in the 50s and the 40s. Mm-hmm. Well, we didn't have anything else. If you didn't have nothing else, you had one bat for the whole team mm-hmm. and, and one, one glove for the whole team <laughs> and played a great game. No, and Jackie signed one his contract ball. at $10,000. Okay. the same. It's the same economics as the, the kids back then. But now, when you sit back and you think about how it was for us here back then, in those countries that we just mentioned, that's happening with them every day. That's right. But it comes down to economics, like he stated. One player of Barry Bonds, his check will bring 20,000 athletes here to America to play baseball. So where does that leave American black kids, or white kids for that matter? We don't have no parks for them to play. You know, it'd be great if we was in the soccer here in the United States because that's where all the baseball fields went to the soccer fields. Well, it's low low overhead, one ball. True. <laughs> you have a question, sir. Thank you. I'm speaking about as a stickball player from Queens. My man. As a stickball player from Queens in the 1950s. Am I saying something wrong? No, no, no. no, no, no. You're no, wrong. No. You're wrong. He's trying to make, trying to make contact the in the back. The next I'm sorry. I have two thoughts, Mr. Thomas, and that is uh, one: the in the six, 1968 when you and your colleagues did that heroic act, the streets were filled with people who were anti-war people such as us, anti-apartheid, for Patrice Lumumba, uh, Columbia takeovers. We were involved, and when you did your action, uh, (coughs) you were a hero to us, and we were probably a hero to you too, because we took, made tremendous sacrifices. Uh, in In 1968 was a highlight of my life. The second thought is Paul Robeson. Uh, Paul, you mentioned Paul Robeson. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Paul Robeson was wiped out. Everyone knows Paul Robeson, the great Paul, right. as we, he was called in Harlem, the great Paul Robeson. And he was uh, a three-time Olympic, a three-time, rather, All-American at Rutgers. And he was still wiped out. And most young people I speak with have never even heard of Paul Robeson. Right. You mentioned Paul to older folks, and you say the, they'll say the great Paul. Uh, one of the reasons I went to law school is the man who represented Paul Robeson was a man named Leonard Boudin, mm-hmm. the Emergency Civil Liberties Committee. Thank you. And he fought to get Robeson's passport back because right. they took his passport, as you well know. They took his passport so he couldn't travel. He couldn't sing Absolutely. in England where he had supported the coal miners. And uh, I worked for Paul. I worked for Leonard Boudin. And, He convinced me about law school. I was thrilled. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make those comments about thank you for mentioning Uh, Paul Robeson Mm -hmm. and thank you for mentioning 68 and what we did in 68 too. We've got a couple of people. And stickball. And stickball as well. Okay. Okay. We've got a couple of folks here. We've got some hands up over here too. So let's make sure we can get some more folks. Okay. So my question is that. Where are are you? Step uh, up please. Hi, sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, stand sorry, stand up. Yeah. Sorry, so I, I'm asking about what you think, because you kind of touched on it, but you didn't get quite to it, uh, the NCAA and the compensation uh, situation with the, the court case that a couple of weeks ago came down that, that, well, they made a decision about that they can't restrict compensation to students that are actually athletes, but because they're restricting their income when they have a talent that they could, like the, both the NBA and the NFL and the NCAA. And it's really, they make millions of dollars. We're starting the tournament now. And these kids are not making millions of dollars, but the schools are, the NCAA is, all these CBS, you know, whoever it is that's, uh, that's doing that. So what do you think about yeah, that? John, pay the players. How that's related to uh, these things. Pay the players. Yeah, they're long overdue. They're long overdue. I, uh, first of all, the, the case that you're talking about is is a fairly new case. They have to go through the process. But the, the fact is that they took the initiative to take the NC to a to court. That in itself is a giant step. Uh, for the simple reason that, you know, when I was an athlete, the AAU, that's the Amsterdam Athletic Union, and the NC two A were feuding. They were feuding about who had the most power over the athlete. AAU would run a meet, NC2A would tell you, say, you're a college student, if you're running that meet, we're going to take your scholarship away. Okay. AAU would tell 
they pulling to see who's going to control the money. But the AAU and the NC2A was given, I wouldn't even say it was crumbs, it was dust that was given the athletes. When you sit back and you think about an athlete, think about an athlete that go to college. Here's an individual come home, high school, he's a great athlete, everyone's knocking on his door, screaming, come here, come here, come here, we're going to do this, we're going to do that for you. And then the individual goes, he chooses one school. When he goes to that school, he's young, he's naive, he don't know any better. I'm a good athlete, and I hope to be an even better student. But the school has a different motive. Their motive is to make money on this student. They'll hold up the degree, you might get your degree, and mind you, the key word is might get your degree. Because we had so many of them that went through college, played for four years, never got a degree. Mm -hmm. But here it is. In that four years' time, let's use Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Lou Alcindor, right out here in this city right here. When Kareem went to UCLA, the first thing they did, they said, well, let's put a name on his back. It says Lou Alcindor. Let's see how many jerseys we can sell. Mm -hmm. Just the first game. Let's see how many beers we can sell off of Lou Alcindor. First game. Pretzels, the first game. Let's not get into how many people went to the parking lot every week to see his game. Not to mention how many people from UCLA bought everything relative to him playing basketball at UCLA. Not to mention that the TV industry, they decided we're going to televise maybe 10, 15 of his games at three, three million, three, five a game. Sounds like a machine. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> it's a money. It's a, it's a piggy bank. But the only difference is everyone else is feeding off the bank, and the bank itself doesn't have any weight. Because they play for that four years, but they get no guarantees. The school gets all the guarantees. The Olympic Committee, they bring us to the games, and we love going to represent America and go to the Olympic Games. That's the greatest sport in the world to go to the Olympic Games. But one, you have to think to yourself, I'm a poor kid off the block. I come and they get me caught in patriotism. I'm hung on this. I want to represent America, and I got old glory in my eyes. But coming off the streets here in New York, you know, when I look around, I'm looking and I'm seeing 80,000 people every day in that stadium in Mexico City. And one day they started chanting, Carlos, Carlos, Carlos. And it made me start thinking. All them people chanting Carlos. And I see the Brinks truck in the back. But I don't never see the Brinks truck come around by my house <laughs> to drop nothing off of my house for all the chanting they was doing for me or for the metal count that I had on the wall. So somebody's getting pimped. Then you have to ask yourself the question, if you seriously involved in the game, are you the pimp or are you the pimpy? <laughs> okay? Now, right. athletes find out later on down the line that they have been pimped for many years. So you got to deal with the issues at hand. You can't deal with them down the line. People told me I was a troublemaker because I would talk about the money issues. I'm talking about the AAU going to tell me running this track meet because they won't televise the girls track meet. Well, I'm going to go and support the girls. I want their meets to be on TV. And then the NC2A come in and say, well, if you're running that track meet there, you won't be able to run at San Jose State no more. And my attitude is this, because I don't have no fear. I'm going to die no matter what I do. You might have fear out there, but you're going to die too. Okay? So when they tell me about don't run because we're going to take your scholarship away, take my scholarship. And by example, I'm going to support the girls. Okay? But see, I had to let them know that I know. Yeah, you can take me away because you're the cow that gives the milk. But I'm here to let you know that I'm the grass that the cow has to eat in order to give the milk. If there's no grass, there's no cow. Right. And by the way, John, as we say, I know we've got, we've got time for, I think we've got like 10, 12 more minutes, so if we can go quickly. Um, as an aside, the, uh, when the Olympics are over, the athletes sell their jerseys and stuff to make money. Yes. Hi. Okay, so this is a huge honor. Um, I do believe I've known you since I was an embryo. Mm. Uh, you were in the iconography of uh, my operating system. 
you, Malcolm X on that bamboo chair, uh, Hugh Masekela, Fela, you. So, huge honor. So I produced a show called Black Issues Issues, which is a satire on a magazine called the Black Issue Issue Magazine. So we explore different things like the Blackulator, a black calculator that calculates black oppression since 1619. So we would add this issue to that, the, the athletes getting pimped, how much money are they owed. Also, we, we talk about something called woke washing. So when companies and individuals act like they care about social justice issues, but instead, they're making more money. So here comes Nike. Nike says, oh my God, we're with Cap. And how much money did Nike make? A, yeah, it's a billion dollars. They made a billion dollars in that time last summer. So my question is, is Nike woke washing? Do they actually care about anything social justice, much less the black community? And then my final question would be, what does black power look like in 2019 and beyond? Does it look like the fist? Does it look like the Nike swoosh? Does it look like Puma? What does black power look like? That's on you right there. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to listen to OK, the first part of your question. Uh, what was the first part again? <laughs> what do you think of Nike? There's Nike okay, woke washing. Nike? Yeah. Okay. Does Nike care right, about me, black people? Let me just like tell Kanye asked. <laughs> uh, any other company? Mikey, Nike had good business sense. You understand? They had very good business sense where other, other people would run away. Like if you notice, in 1968, there was an athletic shoe on the victory stand as well the Puma shoe. Why did I take the Puma shoe out there and put it on that victory stand for it to be visible for everyone to see? It's because when I ran up and down the streets in New York and I went to Adidas, it was two companies at that time. Adidas was the number one uh, athletic shoe company and Puma was coming on. And I think they had Converse for basketball. <coughs> well, when I went to Adidas and asked Adidas for a pair of shoes, they looked at me and told me, see, you're nobody, we don't know you, you would never get no shoes from us. <laughs> and I looked at them and I felt, Offended. And I said to him, Yo, you made a big mistake. You don't know me now, but you wish you did tomorrow. <laughs> Which came to, came to fruition. But the Puma people, when I went to them after I'd gone to Trinidad and lost my job, come back home, I went to them, my wife was pregnant, I needed a job. Hey man, I was wearing your product over in Trinidad. They went on a strike, Pan Am Airlines, I need a job. All right, go on, work in the warehouse. They didn't know who I was. And when they found out who I was, they said, well, we're going to bring you out the warehouse, man. We're going to put you out. And I had to make shoes them all over. The point that I'm trying to make is there was loyalty with me to Puma. Puma didn't show any loyalty. Cap was with Nike all the time. Cap didn't have to be the one that they chose. But based on what Cap stood for, they said, hey, man, we could do a double fold. We could do a two-bill. First of all, to support Cap and let him be able to express who he is, why he is, and where he is. And then the second thing, we'll take the gamble and see how many people go and support us. Because, yeah, we got the right wing out there talking about we're burning the jersey and we're burning the Nike shoes and this and that. But that's the few, minute few, I might add. The largest percentage of people admired what Nike did, I admire what Nike did. And the fact that they did it, I think, enhanced his fight in the NFL as well. Now the question is, what is Cap going to do in the interim? Okay. What's the second half? What does Black Power look like? What does Black Power look like in 2019 and beyond? What is Black? You said in be honest. In beyond. Oh, beyond. Beyond. 2019 and beyond. Black Power. <laughs> black Power. Black Power. Hey, don't lie. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, what does a black power look like? Uh, well, yeah, I would have to say that from this point on, as I stated earlier, black power is going to have to be dealt through education and endurance. That's the only way black power is going to be able to exist and just flow all, all across the land. It's for us to be serious, let them know we're serious, let them know that we're on the same page, let them know that we're fighting for equality. We ain't trying to put nobody down, but we're trying to pick ourselves up and we won't allow anyone to get in the way of us standing up. Okay? That's what black power is to me, to be assertive, 
to be direct and have a vision in terms of where you want to go and what you want to leave for your kids. But we have to be one in order to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know why you almost got thrown out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. It's a Appreciate pleasure to meet you. You're my hero. I have two, uh, really, one question. Just take me back to that day in 1968. Did you, you and this planned already? Like, if you won, you was going to raise the fist? And if you didn't, what other means did you have of maybe getting you know, across, getting the message across? Well, you know, when they took the vote, we took a vote as to whether we was going to boycott or whether we were going to go to the games. Well, they decided they wanted to go to the games. My attitude was, I'm staying home. But whoever the creator is, he came to my brain, he said, dummy, listen up. He said, if you stay home, someone from America, as great as America is, going to go in your spot, and the question is whether they would represent you the way you want to be represented on your victory stand. So I ran my rounds, and then we got to the quarter semi, and I made up my mind that I was disenchanted about the fact that the boycott was called off. And I said to Tommy, I said, Tommy, I'm not happy about the boycott being called off. I'm disenchanted about it. I want to make a statement. What's your take? He said that he was with me. When he said he was with me, the race was his. There wasn't no competition about beating Tommy in the race. The race is yours. You want the medal, I want the statement. So we had a marriage. From that marriage, it came about what artifacts do we have to bring to the table. He said he had the gloves, I had the shirt, I had the beads, he had the scarf. We were all wearing black socks with our pants rolled up. I felt it was necessary to take the Puma shoe out there. 25 minutes prior to us going to that victory stand, didn't nobody know what was going down but God, John Carlos, Tommy Smith, and eventually Peter Norman. Nobody knew. They ran, you know, when Stan Wright said was, something was going to Stan Wright was the assistant coach. When he got wind that something was getting ready to go down, he ran to ABC, don't put the camera on him, don't put the camera on him. And you know, ABC almost hit him in the head. He <laughs> talking about don't put the camera on him. See, because ABC, or any network for that matter, even though they might say it was a negative, they wanted to be the first to show it to the world. So yeah, man, we had a plan, but the plan was only 25 minutes before it happened. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got time for three more questions. We got one here. We got in the cap right there in this, and, um, and then whoever, I didn't keep track. Oh, what it comes here, right here, right here. Okay. And look, we got until eight o'clock. Do we? Okay, yeah. we got time. A few we more got okay. eight o'clock, so, so just bring them up. Okay, let's go. Indeed, peace. Thank you both for being here. Uh, what an honor. My name is Chris, I'm from Ebbsville, born and raised, 1700 Bedford Avenue. Hey man, you gotta stand up, man, you gotta stand up. You gotta stand okay. Up. I can't, I can't see you, man. There you go, brother. As said, I represent Ebbsfield here tonight, and my question uh, regards uh, what inspired you to write The Heritage and what were your takeaways uh, toward uh, Sir Carlos's point about uh, one mindset was the term you use. What, what prescription can you both offer from your lived experience and from your research as well as your lived experience as uh, what should young uh, black athletic activists be doing uh, for the next generation? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Uh, well, to me, the, um, the impetus to doing the book really came from two things. The first was, was watching both Trayvon and Ferguson. Those were the two things that were happening that made me think, you know, how the athletes responded to those two events. That was the first thing. The second thing that made me think about this project was watching the increased police presence and militarism and fake patriotism that's taking place when you're watching a sporting event. It was these two things combined that just made me think, why is there an American flag the size of the 50 yard line on everything? And so you started to realize that there was a post 9-11 effect. So the combination of post 9-11 America and the post Ferguson black athlete made me think, something's up here, we need to talk about this. Um, as for the athletes, uh, you know, John and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, when we were talking about this sort of gap between Malcolm Jenkins and between Colin Kaepernick, and we're talking about LeBron James and what these players are doing. I think the players are in a really interesting position in between, it, they, they are multi-billion dollar corporations right now, they're individual corporations. So the question for me when it comes to the athlete is, can you protest yourself? I mean, if you're LeBron James, you're the boss and the protester. So what's going to happen to the player as the player's power increases? 
And you're starting to see it now with the players having their own sort of, uh, they've got their own production companies now, they've got their own TV shows, so they can actually box out. They can control the journalism, they can control the message, but they're also expected to be corporate partners and also be protesters. You can't have everything. So it's gonna be real interesting to see what they do. Well, it's obvious there's a new paradigm out there. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the youngsters out there see something that maybe we haven't seen collectively in a long, long, long time, to the point where when you sit back, you say, when the last time do you remember a basketball team stepping up like the Golden State Warriors, okay, to support the LA Clippers when that mm -hmm. situation went down? They've got power so, now. They so appreciate the, their power. The, the, the difference is this. They have power, yes. But power is not power if it's just a fleeting power. You understand? Mm -hmm. Power is something that you have that you control and you can sit on the shelf and say, when I go to the shelf tomorrow, it's going to be there. If I go mm -hmm. next month or next year, it's going to be there. Power is power. Power is not transferable. You know, to the point we say, well, today we got power. We don't know what we have tomorrow. No, that's right. You understand? Because as, as much as the Golden State Warriors made a strong statement, that statement dissipated right away as well. Let me tell you about the Clippers. Why this came about. What's the owner of the Clippers? What was his name? Which one, Sterling or Balmer? Sterling. Donald Sterling. No, 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 no. no. The, the bad owner of the new one. The, the old one. Donald Sterling. Sterling, Sterling? Sterling? yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, for some reason, I'm thinking that was David Stern, okay. No, he's an old commissioner. No, all right, <laughs> Donald Sterling made some racist, derogatory statements about Magic Johnson, okay? So when the young lady heard these statements, she, she put it out there public. And when ownership got wind of it, they went to Sterling, told Sterling, said, look, man, you're going to have to sell the team. Sterling said, man, are you crazy? You were talking about we have to sell the team. Why am I selling the team? You're selling the team, man, because of what you said. Sterling looked at him and said, what are you talking about? We all say it. And they said to him, well, well Mr. Sterling, it's true, we all say it, but it's one difference. We say it on the private side of the door, and you said yours on the public side of the door. You understand? So you're going to sell the team. I'm not selling the team. Now, mind you, that team wasn't worth $400 million. But they told him, yes, you're going to sell the team. Why are you going to sell the team? Because these black athletes have woken up. You woke them up with this statement. In order for us to squash them waking up, we have to sell this team. Now, the team is worth maybe $400 million. We're going to give you $2 billion for a $400 million team. We will buy this team. That's like what they used to tell you, say, when you move in a white neighborhood, they don't want you in the neighborhood. We gonna be nice. Hey, Mr. Carlos, boy, do we have a deal for you. <laughs> you paid 200,000, we can give you 700,000 for this house. But I like the neighborhood. No, we gonna give you eight now, <laughs> okay? So until they realize that we have to have depth, we have to have long jeopardy and any statements that we make. It can't be a fleeting moment in terms of saying, yeah, we have the power today, but we don't know what we have tomorrow. Yeah, and also the power, you know, how much power do you actually really have if you can't speak, if they're gonna take your career from you? Do you actually really have power if you're gonna get blackballed? So, I mean, this is one of the real questions. You have a question here. And then my man back here, because he's had his hand up. He's got the mic in his hand, so at least we know you're next, right? Hey, my name, you. Got it? Uh, my name is Wendy Hilliard, and I actually come from the world of gymnastics. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. But I, I have a, a couple questions because you talked about the women's support back in the day because we haven't talked a lot about the female athletes and where they stand. I did, um, I have a foundation, we did a black history. We were finding out who was the first black uh, gymnast to make the Olympic team. Everyone thought it was Ron Gallimore in 1980. It was actually John Kennedy Allen in 1968 mm -hmm. who identified as an American, Native American, when the press asked him. So I wanted you, and this just happened like three years ago that this was unveiled because he was a black American. Talk about what was going on in 1968 for all of the athletes when you're preparing for this. Um, you know, and, and the female athletes too, you mentioned Wyoming Atias. It was a really powerful thing. So give us a little bit of that and where the women athletes fit in all of this. Let's move okay. Forward. Well, first of all, you got to remember that you was dealing with some egotistical male figures. You understand, we didn't see women you know, we had them blinders on them talking about. They didn't see the 
the, the weight of the women, they didn't see the presence of the women involved in this. I don't know whether Professor Edwards felt like we're the men and we're supposed to be doing manly things and the women has no role in that. And I told him back then that he made a mistake and I still tell him every day that I think he made a mistake. Uh, the women play a tremendous role based on what Tommy Smith and Peter Norman and I did. They supported us 1,000%. <coughs> Whereas they should have been able to be on ground floor to support all of the activity in terms of probably educating a lot of the men that didn't have the heart to say, man, you know, even though I want to go for that medal and even though I've trained all these years, I think it's valid based on this woman sitting down and making me understand a little better. Still, guys listen to women a little more than they listen to hardheads. I believe that. Now, my wife can get my attention. She tried to tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, my, that was my daughter. That was my boss. Oh, you, oh, you, oh that was boss. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, and when you sit back and you think about the role of women today, I think women are just really coming alive today. I think they're just being born into all of this right now. And what you see in the women's movements across this country, and even for that matter, across the world, uh, to the point where men go have to take a second seat and sit back and watch what the women do. And I think, you know, as, as sad as it might say, as long as the men been riding or steering the ship, so to speak, the women going to take them to what do you say, Mecca? Right. Well, it was nice to actually hear Wyoming talk about this because after you know, everything that she had done, both in 64 and 68, when we finally talked to her, as Tony, you remember, and Sarah, she finally said, well, nobody asked me. It's only been 50 years. Nobody asked me. Right. Uh, you have a question back there, sir. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, good evening. Uh, it's been a great panel. Uh, my question kind of stems from what you had said previously on if you can't, speak like what kind of power do you have um what would your take be on the opinion that the nfl actually won that lawsuit so they paid cap 80 million dollars but they had him sign a non-disclosure agreement pertaining to to keep their secrets right mm -hmm. so you know they're not going to say anything but he legally can't say anything either so if i'm looking at that optically you know, 80, they're giving out $80 million contracts kind of left, right, and center. So, you know, to pay him $80 million yeah, to kind of mm -hmm. go away, but wouldn't that that's, be that's, them winning? That's specula speculation right now. Though. We don't even know what part, that dollar right? amount was. See, because we don't know what, what the incentive was, you know, when he got the contract, when he got that, that money. They might have put a non-disclosure, but the non-disclosure would have to be dealing with, I would think, relative to the settlement of the lawsuit relative to uh, collusion. But I don't think they can get him to sign anything to tell him, say, man, uh, uh, we, if I go to another NFL team, I'm not going to take a knee. It's just like, you know, uh, Ben, uh, what's his name, Michael, uh, ben, Michael Bennett? Michael Bennett. Mm -hmm. Michael Bennett is going up there to New England, left Philadelphia and going to New England. And Michael Bennett made it very clear. Yeah, I'm going to play for the New England Patriots, but I'm not coming out for the National Anthem. I'm going to stay in the locker room, and I'm going to still keep my protests going. See, and that's what I'm saying, man. You know, not to say we want to knock the NFL or we want to knock America, and we just want the NFL and America to pay attention and make them realize that, hey, man, you're stepping upon the rights of individuals. You're stepping on their First Amendment rights to make various statements. You can't do that based on the fact that I signed the contract to play football. You can't make me drink poison because I don't want to drink poison. Yeah, you know what I was gonna say, John. You know what I'm conflicted about this. I, I I get the point, and I and I understand the idea that okay, Colin took whatever that dollar amount was, and now the NFL gets to keep their secrets. But I don't think I think that's putting too much on Colin. I think that Colin Kaepernick sued the NFL because they took his job. Right. That's it. And then the rest of it is up to everybody. And so you've got, it's essentially, it's, it's a two-pronged issue. One, they took his job, they denied his employment, they paid him X amount of money for that. And I think it's really, really difficult to ask him to also say, okay, well, you should have sacrificed that too so we get discovery on the NFL. I think that is the, that's the job of the players, all the generations of the players. They and they, support. exactly, and they got to support, and they didn't do that. Um, like I stated, I stated earlier, you know, it's, it's, it's early right now, man. We're going to just wait and see what happens down the line. Uh, I don't know, you know, what, what the NFL could do in terms of saying, sign this, this letter of secrecy right now 
it has to have variables as to what I'm being secret about. Am I being secret about how we negotiate this $80 million? Or am I supposed to be being secretive about what my activity is when that anthem is being played? Mm -hmm. Okay? So on that, man, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. See what the players do. Can we be quick enough to get two questions in? The man in the white hat has a question, and then the man in the yes. middle yes. also uh, Good evening. How are you doing, John? No, we have Thanks that guy investigate. <laughs> uh, we go back a long way, and uh, Nat, can you stand a minute? This is my brother, Nat, here, who was, uh, we, we were uh, city champions in track and field, and we grew up with John being one of our heroes. They used to beat me. And, and, <laughs> and Wendy Hilliard, who just spoke, was an Olympian. This she did not in, say that. This place I is embedded. Needs, she needs it's embedded. Yeah. Um, uh, I wanted, this uh, question is along the same line, but a slight twist. When we came up in high school, uh, it was always all boys track and field. And we had the pleasure of girls coming from other teams with picnic baskets because uh, Nat and I went to all boys school, D with Clinton. And um, then Title IX came along. And it was be very beneficial to my uh, granddaughters, my daughter. Uh, they were athletes. and. We, now, just like everything can be reversed, and one of the issues I have is when we do, like you say, power has to be fixed. What do we do about the reversal of Title IX where we have boys in Connecticut running as girls, taking state champs away from girls? <coughs> and that's something that we're going to have to address next. We're going to have to really think about how we think about gender and how it's being imposed how one victory is used as a club to beat you for your successes. So we, uh, that's, I would have thought I'd probably to Howard because I know you're doing a lot of research. You might want to, I mean, <laughs> on how hey, we Hey, John, you want to take that, that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, Kenny, you know, that's a very good question. But uh, in terms of how you're going to turn that around, man, you got to get numbers with you. You got to have numbers of people are speaking on, on just that issue, okay? I mean, when Bobby Riggs went to play, what's, what's the Billy Jean King. <laughs> Billy Jean King. Billy Jean King. No, who's the other one? The, the oh, the first one? The, guy, the one that had the sex change. Did she Michael play against, didn't have a sex change. She played against uh, Bobby Riggs too, Renee, right? Renee Richards. Yeah, did she play Bobby Riggs too? All right, so what I'm saying is, they stopped that based on the volume of people that got up and spoke on that issue. And until we come together, as I stated earlier in the conversation, until we come together and let our feelings be known about what they're doing, they're depriving your daughter because they want to put somebody else in there that has an altogether dif different anatomy than her. Until it says it's okay. Well, it's okay until enough people get up and say it's not okay. Okay? So you got to stay fast, but at the same time, Kenny, you got to look around and see how many people got your back on what your issues are. Because I'm sure it's a lot of people out there that have that same concern, but we don't never make our concerns public. Yeah, um, you know what? I'm, I'm at the stage where I just got to say, I don't know yet. <laughs> um, last question, sir, in the middle. Uh, I just want to make a statement first. Um, you had spoke about, someone asked you about what does black power or where we go from here. Um, Along that line, I, I want to state that you mentioned three white people that history books have written out. Um, growing up in, in the South, my parents used to tell me, black people can't move forward without the help of white people. And throughout our history, every main event, there's been some white person behind a black person to help them move forward, but they don't ever get credit. My question to you, when you did what you did, I'm pretty sure there were some black people that were very jealous and they hated you for it, but there's some white people who came forward and supported you. And I would like you to, to answer, you know, talk about that See, if that happened. You must have been in that room with us. I was not. <laughs> I was you, not. Must, you must have been in that room with me, Howard and I. Uh, Wasn't that off the record? Hey, man, it was about off the record. Right, right. No, I, man, that's a very, very good point. Uh, but at the same time, you remember this, man. Remember for the duration of time of who's moving the cards around, so to speak. You understand? Black people don't run the, the journalism. We don't run the TV shows. You understand? We don't run 
the publishing companies. They want to write somebody out of the picture just like a script. They can write them out. They want to write somebody in, they can write them in. I've been talking about Peter Norman for eons. Understand? But when I, if I do an interview and I talk about Peter, when the interview is said and done, they put it in print, they don't even mention it Peter. Out. You understand? But it's for the general public to step up to the point and say, hey, man, I remember X, Y, Z. Are you going to put so-and-so out of the picture? I remember him. For instance, anybody here been to the new museum in D.C., the Black History Museum? You notice the statue that they have up there of us? Okay, it's a guy named Lonnie Bunch. And Mr. Bunch told me that he was going to put the statues up there, ask me, will I give him my blessings? Sure, Mr. Bunch, you got my blessings. That's a great thing. You want to put us up in the Smithsonian? Fantastic. I'm thinking about my mom and dad. You know, I told him I'd take the name to the next level. That's doing it. <laughs> okay? Well, I said to Mr. Bunch, I said, uh, Mr. Bunch, you going to put all three of us up there? He said, no, I'm going to put you and Tommy Smith up there. I said, no, Mr. Bunch, you're going to put Peter Norman, Tommy Smith, and John Carlos up there. No, I'm going to put Tommy Smith and John Carlos up there. You guys are American, and you're black, and this is Black History Museum. I said to him, I said, well, look, let me tell you, Mr. Bunch, if you're not going to put Peter up there, don't put John Carlos up there. And the reason I'm saying don't put John Carlos up there is because this is not about race. This is not about color. This is about an act to focus on race and color. That man was as strong up there as Tommy Smith or as strong as John Carlos. You cannot negate and put him out. And now when he said, well, what did you say? I said, if you don't put him up there, don't put me up there. And I was adamant about it. So now Peter Norman's up there. But now he realized at the same time that so many people come back, man, and just love the fact that Peter Norman had the heart, the integrity to stand there and say, man, I'm willing to sacrifice everything. See, y'all don't know on one side of America they had Tommy Smith. Let's go over there and kick Tommy down. On the other side of America, they had John Collins. Let's go over there and stomp on him. But when they stomping on me, Tommy got a rest. When they stomping on Tommy, I got a rest. But where did Peter Norman get a rest? You think he got a rest? No, they beat Peter 24-7, 365. But Peter never flinched. He never denounced us. He never denounced what we stood for. He never went back and said, oh, I'm sorry. Could I have my job back? Yeah, they drove him to drink. They drove him to nervous breakdowns. And eventually they drove him to a heart attack and he died. But he never, never changed his attitude towards humanity. And you cannot take that away. I don't care what color Peter Norman is. If he's white and he did what's right, he deserves all the honors that he gets. And the problem is that most individuals don't have the heart like I had to say, man, if you don't put Peter up there, don't put me up there. Most of them sit back and say, well, if that's what you want to do, then you do what you want to do. <laughs> no, that's, that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's right. I got to make my proud statement. And there you go. Hey, hey, guys, hey, listen, on a serious note, yeah, I know, Blaine, I know you're shaking your head, but I'm going to say it anyway. And hey, look, I don't like applause, okay? My wife be upset. My partner here, he's shaking his head. But on the serious side, I don't like applause. You know, I tell people, say, if I come up here and I can sing, and I always wish I could sing, but I can't. <laughs> okay? If I could do a star shoot dance, and y'all want to applaud, then I'm with it. But I'm not singing, and I'm not dancing. I'm here to try and make a connection. God tell me I got to make a connection with one person in this house right here in order for my job to be done. That's what I focus on, making that connection. When you leave here, say, man, I got something out of this guy. But I don't want you to think that you came here for the show. This is not the Apollo. <laughs> okay? So let's get the connection. Let's get it on. Let's ask some good questions. And let's go have some good times before we get out of here. Because mm -hmm. well, I need to talk to Jackie exactly. Jr. anyway. Well, <laughs> David, um, I would like to give some applause to all of you for Thank coming. You. I'm with you. And for being <laughs> very patient and for everybody. And... Um, 
if the uh, museum would have us, I'd love to do it again. John, thank you so much. Oh, and we are good. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you one more time.